I don't know what the date is. I believe the day is the 20th. Is that right? No? 13th. I'm just trying to get ahead. Stay ahead of the game. Today's the 13th. Praise the Lord. Amen. Trying to get Thanksgiving quicker. But we're thankful to be in God's house today and be with all, all of you, to all of our guests that have taken time out of your schedule to come and worship with us. We appreciate it. And we're thankful that you're here this morning. Praise God, all of our guests. Thankful that you're here. We had a great time yesterday at our men's day down in Sanford, North Carolina. Praise God. We had about 10 men represented there. And we heard messages from Pastor Akers, Pastor Grizzle from Wilmington. Uh, we heard Pastor Garnett from Asheboro. And the featured speaker uh, was Pastor Nathan Batson from Nashville, Tennessee. We had lunch together. We left and went to Bass Pro Shop together. We ate again together. And if we would have spent another 30 minutes somewhere, we'd have ate again before we got home. But we had a time. We had a time, and we're just excited about that. If you didn't get to go this year, next year, make plans to go. Matter of fact, next year in September is our National Men's Conference. Praise God. And so we're excited about that already. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to turn to Psalms 106. Psalms 106, and we're going to begin reading at verse number 1. Amen. Psalms 106 and verse number 1. Praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord, and who can show forth all his praise. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteous at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the good gladness of thy nation, and I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remember not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them. For his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Verse number one, praise you the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Even though they badmouth you, and even though they talked against you, he's still part of the Red Sea anyhow. That they could grow across. That your name would be known among all nations. For his mercy, verse number one, endureth forever. When they were running their mouth, his mercy was still there. I'm thankful for that this morning. We're going to continue this morning in our series for the month of November in giving thanks unto the Lord. Can we lift up our hands to the Lord right now and just open this, this message with a prayer of thanks. God, we thank you. And we worship you, Lord, today, God, for your many blessings, for allowing us, Lord, to be in this house of worship today. We declare, Lord, your name great, great and mighty in this place today. We ask you, Jesus, Lord, that you would touch us in this house. We give you all the praise, Lord, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated on this Sunday morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Thanks today is an expression of a song that they sung this morning. It's an expression of gratitude. It's where we take time to express how very thankful we are for something that someone in their kindness has done to us. You know, it is a difference when you help someone who shows gratitude and when you help someone who doesn't show it at all. There have been people that without having to ask, I've walked up to and handed them 40 or $50 knowing they were struggling. Those kind of people seemingly 
express so much gratitude, even when you're not looking for it. They seem to express so much gratitude. However, there are others that have asked. And before the conversation was over, made me feel like I owed them something. And I would withhold from it because I knew that many times that their mother had not been in Greenville Hospital for the last 15 years. Same people saying the same thing, coming by the church, doing the same thing. It's the same pastor. We haven't changed pastors here like many churches have had to do in, in years. Two or three years, the pastor's gone. So for 22 years, some of the same people came by. They were coming from California or New York City. They need enough gas money to get from here to Greenville. I wanted to say, how did you get from California to here? But now you need more gas money to go to Greenville. It's just a, just a few miles up the road. And that Knowing that that same mother hadn't been in the hospital all them years, it's the same individual telling the same story to every church in town. But yet you say no. They try to put you on a guilt trip. Sometimes the Lord doesn't give us what we ask. Sometimes the Lord hears our prayer, and He doesn't answer it the way we think He should answer it. It seemingly many times may rub us wrong, especially the younger we are in Christ until we mature in the Lord. But understand if you could jump ahead a few years and learn a few things this morning that might help you along the way is that not every prayer that we pray, God is going to answer the way we thought He should answer it. That is, again, His mercy. Because if you're praying to win the lottery, like some of you are, the Powerball or whatever kind of things they got going on, and you're praying to win the lottery, and maybe you haven't won it, and you wonder why God hasn't answered your prayer. It could just be that God understands the spiritual outcome more than you understand the spiritual outcome. I've heard folks say, when I win the lottery, I'm going to pay off the church. I'm going to build a new church. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm thankful that you got all the good intentions. But God sees more than our intentions. He understands our heart. He understands what we can handle, and He understands what we can't handle. Sometimes we pray prayers for God to deliver and set free and heal our loved ones. I know many of you have been there before. I've been there as a young boy. I've been there as a, as a middle-aged man. God save and deliver. But sometimes God doesn't answer that prayer quite like we would like for Him to answer it. He does many times heal, but it's not in the way that we thought He would heal. Many times He delivers, but sometimes it's not the way we thought He would deliver. So when we go through those prayers and when we pray those prayers to our great and mighty God, when they don't come back to us the way we think they should come, we should still give thanks to the Lord that the prayer was answered. It's, it's very, very, sometimes very difficult to do to send gratitude toward God when it seems like He didn't answer the prayer just like we intended for maybe him to answer it. You know, Lord, I, I really am looking for a spouse. A young lady may be praying. I'd like for him to be 6'2", dark-headed, physically fit, and drive a, drive a Tesla. And have money. And out of the blue, God may send in a five foot six, seven, brown headed guy. Name much to look at. Drove a car that his mama drove and left him when she died. And y'all get together and get married, and you ask the question, God, what what happened? What what happened? You know, didn't you find out that he's a millionaire? So God maybe didn't answer the whole prayer like you thought he should have answered it. But he gave you what he knew was best for you. Some of you have prayed for somebody to come along that were rich and you got somebody dirt poor. But be thankful that they treat you right. 
Be, be thankful. Be thankful. When we dedicated our daughters to the Lord years ago, um, I've prayed a prayer over all of my daughters, all three of them. I've prayed prayers like this since they were born. Lord, I don't know what they're praying, but I want you to hear my prayer before you hear theirs. I want you, Lord, to put somebody in their life that's going to treat them the way a lady should be treated. I'm not concerned about what color they are, what color their hair is, how much money they got, what they drive, if they're a country boy or a city slicker. I just want somebody that ain't never going to lay their hands on them outside of affection. Because if they do, I'm going to jail. God, you know this. I'll go to jail. If one of my daughters called me and said, my husband just broke my nose. I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your house. So God, sometimes it may not be exactly what you want, but God knows exactly what we need. And aren't you thankful this morning that our complaining doesn't stop God from giving us what we need? Aren't you thankful this morning that even though we complain about this and complain about that, God still allows the Red Sea to part and God still allows us to walk across on dry land? Aren't you thankful that in many sometimes our unrighteousness and our unholiness, God God corrects us and He still allows us to get across to safety? I'm thankful that my murmuring and complaining don't stop God from giving me what I need. It may not be what I want, but it's what I need. It may not be what I prayed for, but it's what I need. It may not be what I've been declaring, but it's what I need. And many times God needs to step in and just not give me what I prayed, but give me what I need. What we need in these last days is not more lights. We don't need more talent. We don't need more buildings. We don't need more of this and more of that. We need a latter day outpouring of the Holy Ghost that will sweep across everybody, every man, every woman, every child, every... We need a Pentecost that will shake every area in this sanctuary that will cause us to talk in tongues again. That's what we need. Lord, help me get a good education. Then sometimes God would rather have you a good, they'd rather have you have a good prayer life. Because we're leaning on We are leaning on in the 21st century our abilities and not the Lord's. So everything now is dealt with by a therapist. Everything's dealt with by a therapist. Don't don't go hide under the seat. It is the truth. I wish they had these therapists when I was a kid. They would have probably told my mom and dad why I like to get in and out of my seat so much. Well, he's just got energy. My daddy didn't care if I had energy. If he told me to sit down, he wanted me to sit down. I wish my daddy could have talked to a therapist. A therapist could have told him that you can't make him sit down. He's got energy. I wish that therapist could have told my daddy, you can't expect to take him to six nights of revival straight in a row. And him act right in church. Man, it would have made my life so much better. And my rear end wouldn't have had so many scars. It had been wonderful to have a therapist that could have, could have enlightened my father. But God knew what I needed. I didn't need a therapist. I needed someone to teach me the respect for way to act. And approach God. Respectful way to act and approach God is not just for children. If children doesn't see it displayed by adults, they won't act the way they should act before God. 
So sometimes we pray for God to do something for us, and God sends it back our way and says, I'm going to open some doors, but you got to be willing to walk through them. You can't, you can't push your children through doors that you won't walk through. You can't push your children to prayer if you're not willing to pray. You can't push your children to worship if you're not willing to worship. You can't force your grandchildren to do this and do that if you're not willing to glorify God. And sometimes God gives us things that we haven't asked for, but yet it's still an answer to our prayer because our prayer is protect our killed children. God, keep our children. Don't let our children stray away. And then God pushes us to a prayer room and he pushes us to an altar of worship and he pushes us to be faithful and he and when we walked across on dry ground, we understand why he did it. That his name might be known above all the nations. All the nations. Now, if you're a therapist here today, I'm thankful for you, my Lord. There's many of us that need to talk to somebody. But I don't want to allow talking to a therapist to take the place of me talking to God. Because it's known fact, we all need somebody to talk to. If you're struggling today with some stuff, go talk to somebody. But you better be real careful who you talk to. <laughs> if you ever been to the point, you didn't know how you're going to make it another day. I'm just about to give up. I'm just about done. And then you found you somewhere in your living room, your bedroom, out on a hike, walking in the woods, and you just started talking to God. Nobody was around. You just speaking out. Nobody was hearing you but God. And when you got done talking to Him, you felt so much better. Nothing had changed. But you had felt so much better. For now, you've given it to the one that you know can, can navigate your life in the direction that it needs to go. I can't make it, but if I hold... On to God's unchanging hand. I may walk through a valley of the shadow of death. But I'm going to give it to God. Because while I'm walking through that valley. I'm not going to fear the death. And I'm walking through. But God's going to be with me. And so you understand today. That when you talk to the Lord in prayer. It begins to change. And yet sometimes. The more you mature in the Lord. The more you realize. That some things I ask. God is not going to give. In the way I intended it would come. Amen. And I tell you what, I already got my Christmas list. You see, you may not have none, but I got a Christmas list. And I know what I want, how I want it, when I want it, where I want it, what day I want it on. And I don't want nobody telling me what they got me either. Some folks love to go out and buy gifts. My wife loves to go out and buy gifts for people. And then before she gets home, she done called and told them what she got. And then I'm like, why are we wrapping all this stuff? What's the purpose of it? And, and then the way I was raised was, you didn't know what the gift was. That was the purpose of the gift. They handed it to you. That's why mom and dad always taught me. It don't matter what it is, Sean. Y'all ready? See, y'all thought I was way in left field. Mom and daddy always told me, when you get a birthday gift or Christmas gift, or whatever you get at a Christmas party, no matter when you used to draw names and we're going to keep the prizes under $5, no matter what you get, you be thankful and you act excited about it. You know, that's one of the hardest things that this old boy has ever had to do. When somebody hands you something, you're like, oh, yes, yes. And you open it up, and it's just a pair of black socks. How do you get excited over black socks? I mean, no designs, uh, no, no, no logos. It's just plain black socks. I haven't always been 49. I was younger. And then you had, oh, thank you so much. This is just what I had hoped for. It's just amazing what I've received today. I do appreciate this, all your kindness. And you know that they probably pulled it out of something their daddy got five years ago and rewrapped it and give it to you. But you had, thank you so much. This is what I had hoped for. I'm so thankful that God understood what I needed. I praise you for this. Thank you so much. And you went on about your day. And I was taught that you had to be thankful and you had to act like it was the greatest thing. Listen, we need to get back to some of those principles in the spiritual just because 
You've asked God for a Lamborghini and you come driving up in a Toyota. Don't mean you got the right to sit there and look at God and say, God, when you start answering my prayers, then I'll start thanking you. No, that's not how you do it. God knew that you'd be better off with what you got than what you asked for. And so when you get something from God, you should get up on your feet, lift your hands to heaven, and cry out to God with a voice of triumph. Now, you, you see, some of these things, the examples I have may be comical to some of you, but, but this is how it works. Some of us look at others and try to judge our life by others. That's right. And then we get down on ourselves, and we get mumbling and complaining when all God wants to do is part the Red Sea for you and get you out of enemy territory. He's just trying to get you to safety. That's all God's trying to do. And we start murmuring and complaining. And we start looking at what this one has and how things are going over here for this one. And then we start looking at our life and everything is just terrible in my life. Why did God make me this way? I don't know why I'm shaped the way I'm shaped. Why couldn't I have muscles like some of the other guys have muscles? I could if I go to the gym at 5 a.m. like they do. But this is where we're at. Why couldn't I do? Oh, if I, if I, if, 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 why do, why am I, why do I have a belly like I got? Because I ate ten times a day. That's why. Some things are just, some things are just simple, and we want, and we want to blame God. Well, well, if I had what that family over here had, then I could praise the Lord. No, you wouldn't. Because if God would give you what that family has, you'd find another family over here that had more, and you wouldn't praise God till you got that. It didn't say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord because he give you what you wanted. It said, go give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. It doesn't matter if you got a small turkey, a big turkey, or if you have to downsize this year because you couldn't find a turkey and go get somebody's backyard chicken. If you got food on the table, you ought to be thankful that you got food on the table. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what we're preaching and loving this morning needs to be shared in every church, every denomination around America. We are now raising children in a community that is so spoiled and so ungrateful. They don't have no gratitude and it spills over in the spiritual to where now they don't even want to talk to God because God ain't giving them what they asked for. Be thankful you're breathing. Be thankful you're walking. Be thankful you're able to lift up your hands. Be thankful. Oh, God, be thankful for what you do have. Be thankful for the little house. Be thankful for the larger house. Be th- whatever you got, be thankful. Be thankful. Just be thankful. Be, be thankful. There's so many pressures of life of other people trying to push you. Trying to push you. It's a... It's a known common thing in, in, in Pentecost for some questions to be asked of you. In the next couple, week or two weeks, I'll be at a conference, and I'll be asked this question. Man, looks like things are going good in Wilson, and they are. When are y'all going to start building across the street? And I'm thinking to myself, what I want to say is, when God drops about five million dollars, that's when we're gonna start. And and but but what happens is they're just being encouraging. They're just trying to encourage me. They didn't say, "Are you gonna start next week?" They're just trying to build my faith. And the old devil turns that and he turns it around to get me to be discouraged. Oh, it ain't never gonna happen. But see, what you got to do is look at what God has already done up to this point. Listen to me. Just listen to me. What that is across the street is 40 is a 40-acre miracle. 
And if God give us that, then God can use all of us in this room to reach many others. And if God sees fit that we need a new building, God will provide through us a new building. But until that happens, I'm not going to mumble and complain. I'm going to rejoice that we got grass to cut. I'm going to rejoice that we got some place over there for the kids to run and jump. Well, if I had, if, if I had, oh God, if I, if I just had what they had. If I just had what they had. No, how about you start rejoicing over what others are, are, are receiving? Rather than it always being about you. Because it, ain't, it can't always be about you. That man, young lady, is going to get sick of every day, everything being about you. You're going to have to cut his leash every once in a while and let him go fishing. Because he's going to get tired of it eventually. Because even though your daddy said you were a princess, he has found out after about five years you are a demon. You're gonna have to, it can't always be about the church. It can't always be about what the church wants. Sometimes we gotta take our attention. And instead of saying, God, give me, give me, give me, we got to stop and say, God, I'm not asking for anything this morning. I just come to tell you thank you. Now, I'm not saying if you got needs today, I'm not just saying you can't ask him for needs, but there comes a time that we got to quit being so needy. Praise God. I, I, I'm just not going then. If I can't go where I want to go, I'm just not going to go. You, you want to go? You want to go fellowship? Yeah. If we can go eat steak, I will. But if we got to have a hot dog, I'm going home. Well, everybody can't afford steak all the time. I mean, some, some people can. I mean, you know, you, you manage your money right. The older you get, the, the nest, empty nest syndrome. I can't wait till the empty nest syndrome. I'm not going to have the syndrome. I'm going to have a celebration. But some of us, you know, as you live, if you do the way the Bible teaches us to do, he helps us even to manage our money. He says give the 10% and then you get to keep the 90 he just, he, just, he just blesses us for this. And so through the years, as you become grandparents, you've got a little something. You can do a little more than what the kids can do. And that's, I don't feel sorry. Then years to come, I'm not going to feel sorry when Sister Garnett and I leave the house. And we go and we eat a steak at Western Sizzler. And we lead all them kids home. In their home. Spread out across the county. Where are y'all going? We're going to eat steak and you're none of y'all going. You got your own families, you're doing your own thing now, and we ain't paying for it tonight. Mama and I is going. And so when you get to that point, yeah, you'll have more. But when you were younger, you may not could do what you could do now when you're a little older. You don't, don't get such an attitude. I've heard folks say, well, if I got to eat a hot dog, I'd rather go to the house. But get in your car and go on to the house. Go on to the house. Because... You need some upbringing. You need some upbringing. Matter of fact, just don't use a few life stories this morning. This, it works good with things. Whenever mama cooked, she cooked meals and put on the table. And we sat down and ate as a family. And that's something that, that's a tradition that we keep in our house still today. And when we sat down at the table, nobody said anything about what mama cooked. If you had to hold your nose and eat it, and swallow it, you better not say nothing about it. Now, you all know this. You've heard it for many, many years. I didn't like tomato rice. Uh, I didn't like tomato soup, rice, whatever they call it. It was it would gag a maggot, I thought. It just gag a maggot. And so I would, I'd have to eat it, and my brothers loved it, and they were like, when are you going to cook it again, Mom? When are you going to cook it again, Mom? And I was like, would you please be quiet, Stacy and Tracy? We don't want this. This is nasty. And she cooked it. It was on the regular menu. But I never would open my mouth and say anything against what Mama had cooked because Dad said just be thankful that there's something on the table. Amen. Y'all still with me? 
So when you went out fishing with daddy or granddaddy on a fishing boat, them old time fishermen, when they launched the boat, it was for eight hours. It won't none of this. I got to pee. I got to pee. They'd say, well, get on the side of the boat and do the best you can. And then when it come lunchtime, when it come lunchtime, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And they throw you a brown bag. Down that boat, and it hit, it hit, while it come down, it hit that side of the night crawlers. By the time it got to you, it smelled like crickets. And you reached out in that bag, and there'd be a slice of hoop cheese you could eat. And it, that was really good. Well, that's like steak. And then if you want it, you could have your choice. You, you could have a vein of sausages or potty meat. And have no loaf bread, so they give you a pack of crackers, and you look at it like, Man, I, I didn't say I wanted to go to jail. This is jail food. I said, I'm hungry. And they'd look at you and, well, you have to eat that because we're going to be out here a while. And, um, I mean, it was sometimes torment to have to go fishing. And that's what you had. And you didn't say, ooh, and I don't want this. You know what you did? You popped open that behind the sausage. And if you're lucky, if you were lucky, granddaddy had a bottle of vinegar in the boat with him. And he pulled that vinegar in there, and in 100 degrees out there in Lake Wilson or Tar River or Buckhorn Reservoir, you'd take that old plastic fork. If you didn't have a fork, you stuck your old worm fingers and cricket fingers down in there, and you pulled that vina out, and you ate it, and it was so good. I mean, it's no wonder that we didn't die of food poisoning sitting out there on a boat that hot eating vina sausages and all that mess. But what it taught you was be thankful for what you got. I'm preaching about me today. You can sit back and say, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. But I'm telling you, times have changed. Because now, when I pick up Mark every day at 12 o'clock from his play school, and I put him in his car, I say, do you want french fries? Yeah, because his mama has strategically said, this is what he's got to have. So we got to go through McDonald's drive through i got to order a four-piece chicken nugget Happy Meal Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Give me double fries. Don't put no apples in that thing. Don't nobody. We don't want nothing good for you. He wants double fries. Give him a small Sprite, and we want ranch dipping sauce. And let me tell you, a three-year-old knows if it's not like he wants it. And if it's not like he wants it, he will let a 49-year-old man know that it's not like he wants it. But sometimes God leaves the ranch out of the Happy Meal. And sometimes God puts apples when you wanted double fries. And he don't care what you want. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. So when you get it out of the window, you ought to rejoice. God, you knew exactly what I needed. God, you knew exactly what I needed. I wanted something, but you knew what I needed. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Just open up the Happy Meal and be glad there's something in there. Well, it's not the toy I wanted. Now we, now, we laugh at this, but some adults act this way. It's not what I asked for. It's not the Smurf I wanted. It's not the Power Ranger I wanted. I wanted the yellow. I got the red. I'm going to send it back. I was with a, a church group one time. God, I hate to say that publicly, but it was. I was preaching a conference in this church group. A small portion of them ended up eating where we were eating. As a matter of fact, we went to a very fancy restaurant. It's called Wendy's. It's about 10.30 at night. It's the only place open. Fine with me. Some folks think just because I've been preaching 25 plus years and been privileged to preach across this country that i got to have something special. When I tell them, listen, take us to a hamburger joint. They're like, Brother Garnett, you eat hamburgers? And I'm thinking, every single day that I can. That's, I mean, that's the truth. I don't have to have this itchy mind and mama mom and all that stuff they cook in front of you. I don't even know what to cook, and I want to know what I'm eating. I don't want a dessert from the melting pot that costs $75. Give me a Reese's. My God. And so we're standing in there, and we're ordering, and we get back to our seats, and this pastor brought his wife a hamburger. Now, it's pretty simple at Wendy's. 
lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, mustard if you want it, pickles if you want it. She asked for this hamburger not to have any onion. And when she got it, whoa, la, 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 la. She made more noise in that Wendy's over a hamburger than she made the whole conference weekend. And that man got up and said, I'm sorry, honey, they made it wrong. He went back up there and said, we order one without onions. And so the poor little girl took the hamburger and threw it in the trash. You know how us, us country folks are. Don't throw it in the trash. We know what to do with it. Throw it in the trash. I don't care if the hand's been on it. Listen, if food hits the floor around here, I just get it. Three-second rule. Just pick it up and eat it. I mean, just get it. And she went, he went back up there, and she'd get him another hamburger, brought it back. Oh, no, no, no. They put mayonnaise on both sides of the bun. Well, he took it back up there again. Would you put mayonnaise on one side of the bun? It come back the third time. God knows, this is probably why I never went back and preached for them. Third time it come back, I'm sitting across from them. There's about 30, 40 in the restaurant. We just come out of a wonderful apostolic service. We're different. We're different. <laughs> she said, Lord, have mercy. They got the mayonnaise right, but that onion is still back on this same burger. And I said, if you will allow me, sister, I can solve your problem. I'll pull that onion right off that burger. That's all you got to do, pull that onion right off that burger. Matter of fact, my wife would love to have that extra onion. Well, she could tell she got a little frustrated. She got red. That red skin started, white skin started turning red. Got right up here, and she was about to blow a top. And I thought to myself, my God, just be thankful that there was a burger to be given to you, and you could have pulled the onion off of it. Well, Lord, I want a blessing, but this is how I want it. God, I want you to touch me, and this is how I want you to do it. God, I want a miracle, but I don't want to dip in the muddy Jordan. If you get to where you want a miracle, you won't care where you have to dip. You won't care where you have to pray. You won't care what you have to do. If you want something from God, you'll just be thankful that God's willing to give it to you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good. He's a good God. He's a mighty God. He's a long-suffering God. He's a gentle God. He's a God that's above any God. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful that He parted the Red Sea and that He allowed you to go across on dry ground. Musicians are making the word. Be, be thankful. Be thankful. Just, I mean, be thankful. I need to be more thankful. I don't know about you, but I can say this. I need to be more thankful. Man, there's sometimes I look at stuff and I'm just, I get so ungrateful. You know, about to be Thanksgiving. Got to cook a turkey. Got to feed folks. Got to find a tree and put it up. I mean, just got to do this. You know, you know how you get? I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Got to do this. Got to do that. Got to keep this up. Got to keep that up. Walk in my garage and can't even hardly walk in it no more. Open the garage door just so I can walk around the other junk to get to my refrigerator outside to get something extra. All this junk I got in here. All this mess I got in here. Got a, got a barn in the backyard. Got junk all in here. I mean, go walk out there and man, I can get rid of all this junk. And, and what I consider junk, there are people that would love to have one piece of it. One piece of it. Take time sometime. Let Sister Garnett tell you the story. How she rode in on a bus through the jungles of Uganda. And one request that Brother Wilson asked of Brianna and Sister Garnett to bring on their trip was bring as less clothing as you can take. Just the bare necessity, just get by, so wear the same clothes as much as you can, but fill suitcases full of candy. That barrel back there we filled up from trunk and treat. Bring as much candy as you can bring. She was like, I don't know why he wants us to bring candy. He said, I'm going to show you when you get here. 
They filled two suitcases nearly full of cash and took it. And on the ride in and out, miles and miles in the jungle, she'll tell you it was a dirt road, one lane road, jungle on both sides, nothing for miles. And while they would ride down that jungle dirt road at about 20 or 25 miles an hour, she said children would come out of the jungle as they would throw candy out the window. They left a candy trail. She said as long as they could see, the kids would come out of the jungles and would pick that candy up going in and coming out. Kids nowadays, if it ain't the right candy. Now I'm talking about Sean Garnett. If it's not the right candy, then I don't want it. But there's some people in overseas that don't have what Sean has that would love to have a piece of candy that I throw away in the trash can. I know I'm, I'm preaching like I'm getting old, but I guess I am getting a little older. That's why the older you get, the less foods you want to throw away. You want to throw it away because when you throw it away, you're thinking about them kids and them mamas in jungles across overseas that don't have anything, that are starving to death. There's some kid right now laying in a jungle somewhere that will not make it throughout the day because they didn't have enough food to eat, and they're trying to make it all on their own, and yet we got everything we have got everything at their fingertips. God has parted the Red Sea over and over and over and over and over. And we ain't happy with a Red Sea parting. We ain't happy when manna fallen. We're complaining about the promised land. And God is saying, I better take you back to Egypt and let you see what I brought you out of so you can be thankful for what I've already given it to you. You don't have to look long to see God's good. You don't have to look long to see that His mercy is forever. You don't have to look long to understand that in my weakness, God was there in my weakness to help me out of what I was in because I fail and I make mistakes and I'm a dirty, rotten man. But because of the goodness and the mercy of God, He allows me to stand up another day He allows me to lift my voice and say, I love you, Jesus, and I thank you, God, for everything you've ever done in my life. I'm telling you, stop. Stop, Sean, complaining. Stop, Sean, murmuring. Stop looking at what you don't have and start looking at what God has given you. And if you don't feel like you got enough, look at how good God is because that's why you should be thanking Him anyway. thanks give him thanks for his mercy endureth forever anybody got lost loved ones you want to give some thanks about how many has got lost loved ones you want to see come back to God before it's too late and they're not here today that's why I'm down and out you need to be thankful Because wherever they're at, it's the mercy of God that's hovering right now. Well, they're not here, but just be thankful for the mercy of God. They may not see the importance right now. They may be throwing a plug underneath a bush, trying to get that bass to come out. You say, I wish they were here. We all, we we wish they were here. But not like you. It's your son or daughter or grandchildren or aunt or uncle or mom or dad. Or great grandchildren, whoever it is. We want them to be here too, but not as bad as you do. I know you're praying for them and you're believing. But you say, well, I just don't have anything to be thankful for. My family's not here. Be thankful. But after church today, you'll go meet some of those family members that wouldn't come to church. Be thankful they're still breathing. Be thankful that the merciful hand of God has given them another day. For another opportunity. Because one prayer, one day, one Christmas service, one revival service, one camp meeting service, those folks you prayed for are going to walk through these doors. When you thought you had nothing to be thankful for all those years, they just did what they wanted to do. But the goodness and the mercy of God rested upon them. See, it sounds like me. 
Sounds like some of you. Doing our own things. Living our own lives. Didn't need nobody. Sure didn't need God. But God's mercy, even though we wouldn't even mention His name, it just kept us. God's mercy, when we were murmuring and complaining, He said, I'm still going to part the Red Sea in half. Because I shed my blood on Calvary not to destroy you. I shed my blood on Calvary that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God sometimes has to look through all of our complaining and my murmuring and my ungratefulness. But I think sometimes we need to kind of push that aside. We need to look at it as if God, I know it wasn't answered the way I thought it should be answered, but I'm thankful you give me what I needed. I'm thankful you give me what I needed. In closing today, I was, this morning I was thinking about being thankful. You look back in your life and you see to where you were and where you are now. I remember when Beth and I were first married, we were like most young married couples, didn't have a whole lot. We had what we needed. Thankful we had parents on both sides that would encourage us to how to manage and what to do with the money that we received. And I remember one time I needed tires on my vehicle. You know, years ago, if you've been in church any amount of time, people used to pray for everything. I mean, if the cow won't produce some milk, please pray for my cow. She starts producing milk. Farmers send word, prayer requests. Pray, pray for rain. The crops are dying. We prayed for everything. And I prayed that morning. I said, Lord, my tires are messed up. I mean, it had steel coming out the side. A banjo player could have played a good lick on my tires. I mean, it messed up bad. I said, Lord, make a way where I can get some tires. And so I remember that day coming back from work, coming down 97. There's an old tire company there in Rocky Mount that had tires for sale. They had them stacked everywhere. I walked in there. I said, I, I'd like to get a price on a set of tires. He said, what are you looking to spend? I said, as least as I can. He said, I got a deal for you today. Lord. And I was already thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look what the Lord has done. He's going to get me four brand new tires on this car right here. He took me to the back, back of the back, back side of that building. Big old heap of tires. He said, what size you got? And I told him, and he narrowed it down to about 50 tires. He said, all 50 of them tires is the size you need. He said, you might find four out of it that'll work. He said, you find them, you can have them for $5 a piece put on. I said, well, how hard can this be? An hour later, I had found four tires. Different names on every tire. Different tread on every tire. But I left with four tires. Now, it wasn't what I wanted. But God was teaching me a lesson. That it may not come in the form you want it in. But when God does something for you, Regardless if it come in the form that you desired. You might have been complaining, but when God rolls back that Red Sea, stop. Lift up your hand. Thankful because he did it that his name would be known. Everything God does for us is in hopes that we will reach somebody else. Because if God did it for you, Brother Pate, then God can do it for somebody else. And if God did it for some of you over here, then God can do it for some of these over here. And if God's done it for you, then God can do it for some that sit here in this area. You see, whatever God does for you, He's wanting you to give Him thanks and praise that others might hear. Oh, there is someone that loves me regardless of what I look like. There is someone who loves me regardless of the sin that I'm walking in. There is someone that cares about me regardless of what I'm going through. It may not come in the form that I want it, but God is good. God is God is good we all stand today
Bible refers. He refers to many of us. All of us. Most of us in here, as far as I know, being classified as under the Gentile nation. The Jews thought it wouldn't be, wouldn't be good for us to have what Jesus desired for us to have. But Jesus showed himself at Cornelius' house. When they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and then they were baptized, Jesus got a hold of Peter and let him know that this gospel is not just for the Jews. But it's for the Gentiles and whosoever will. The Bible refers to us as being adopted. Being adopted. Unless you have ever experienced physically or naturally being adopted. You may not can relate in its entirety. But we have three children. There's some that stand among us today that have been adopted. But we have three children that all three we have adopted. What that means is they are our children. Some of you may not know this, but the birth certificates on all three of those children at the courthouse and at the hospital names Laura Beth Garnett as their mother. And Brian Sean Garnett as their father. What means is, Brianna, instead of being three that gets the inheritance when mom and I die, you got to decipher amongst six and all the evil sister in laws as well. Because the three we have adopted. Are part of our family. Just this week, as we were riding through town, I looked at my wife and I said, I, "If I would have never agreed with you 15 years ago, I, I couldn't. I couldn't see it like you saw it." Now. I said, "But I, I just don't know." I said, "It's it's it's amazing what God does." I said. We look at Delilah, and Davin, and Mark as our two sons and our, our youngest daughter. When I walk through town with Delilah by myself, now I've become more cautious because Delilah is nearly as tall as I am now. She wants to hold my hand. And I hold her hand in public, folks. Especially of her race. They don't understand. I'm like, hold on a second now. There ain't no abduction going on here. You know, the folks don't, some folks don't under, really don't understand what's happening. But in my eyes, I don't see color. She's my daughter. The boys' hair does not look like their dad's. It's curly. And thank God Sister Garnett has some curly hair. That kind of helps with that situation. But most people can see their skin tone. It's not of their mother and father. But for me and her, we don't even see the skin color. You know why? Because they're our children. We don't worry about their past. We do worry about their future, but we pray and take it to God. And there are some of you in here today that all you're worried about is what you look like. All you're worried about is the past that you've committed. All you're worried about is the sins that you're living in right now. But you see, God made a plan. He has a perfect adoption plan. That you come to Him as you are. You repent of your sins. And you know what He does? He forgives you of your sins. Some folks may say, I can't ever forgive 
just like they've told Sister Garnett and I. I don't, you, I don't know how you'll ever be able to love them children like you love your own, like you love your, your flesh and blood. And I can't explain it, but I can tell you, and our kids already know this, we don't look at them no differently than the ones that God blessed us with our own seed. It's just they're our children, and that's the way, same way God looks at you. He don't look at you by what you can give. He looks at you because you're a child of His. So what if you didn't wear a tie to church today? So what if your hair is not this way or that way? God loves you. God cares for you. God will get you to where you need to be. You just need to walk across when He parts the Red Sea and allow God to do it for you. You go down in the name of Jesus, you come up. The name of Jesus is applied to your life. You are not an alcoholic anymore. You are not an adulterer anymore. That other name you used to have, when you are buried in the name of Jesus, it is washed away. And now you are a child and take on the name of a living God. And then He stamps you His approval. He fills you with His Spirit. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things are come new. And sometimes I stumble into the church because my week has not been a good one. And I stumble into the church because I've got my eyes on material things things rather than spiritual things and I feel like I have nothing to be thankful for but when I look at all that God has done and I see how good God has been then I say thank you Jesus because nobody will ever love me like Jesus not my children not my wife not my mother not my father My mother and father's gone. I don't know what I'm going to do. Who's going to love me? The same one that loved you before you were even formed in the belly of your mother. His name is Jesus Christ. He's going to be there when everybody else is gone. And you just ought to be thankful that you serve one. Thankful. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place today, all among us today, there are different, different levels. Folks are walking through different things of life. You may not understand this man or woman's turmoil. They may not understand yours, but God understands them both. You may be just somebody like me that from time to time gets ungrateful. You just needed for God to kind of whisper in your ear, it's not the way you want it, but I know what you need. You may have walked in here today and thought that all the sins that you committed and the sins that you may be living in has separated you from the love of God. Nothing will separate you from God's love. God loves you. God cares for you. No matter where you end up eternally, in heaven or hell, God loves you and God cares for you. You have a decision to make today to be that one that leaves the majority says I'm going to go back and thank God for what he give me may not have been the way I thought it should have happened but I'm thankful he knows what I need what you need today ladies and gentlemen is a true divine relationship with the one that cares so much for you that he laid his whole life out on the line we could have life and have it more abundantly so I wonder among, among us today in this size of a congregation this size I wonder who would be the first ones that will leave your seat, stretch your hands high to heaven, walk to this altar, and say, I'm not leaving here without first giving God thanks for His goodness and His mercy. He adopted me when nobody else wanted me. He cared for me when everybody pushed me aside. He is that great King, that great Lord, but today I'm thankful He is my Father. And I want to thank you I want to worship you. I want to surrender to you. I want to surrender my life to you today, Jesus. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to surrender my life to you today, Jesus. Surrender, Lord, to you, Jesus.